Doctor Who podcast. As always, I'm Charles Skaggs. With me is my partner in crime and my partner in time, Jesse Jackson. Hello, Charles. Glad to be talking Doctor Who with you. Yes. This is the Doctor Who podcast. Yes. Yes, it is. I may be wearing my Bruce Springsteen <laughs> t-shirt, but yes. No, um, I got solid black on. So oh, okay. I didn't, to, I didn't have time to change to a Doctor Who shirt. But you have the Doctor and Canine behind you. I do have the fourth Doctor and Canine, and why, do you may ask, do I have them? Uh, well, obviously, we're doing more with our Key to Time saga that we started last time uh, with Episode 72 with the, um, the Ribos operation. But this time, we're moving on to the second segment in the Key to Time, the Pirate Planet. You know, and, and, and I was just to say, and I'm yeah. really looking forward to this because – this uh, the Pirate Planet, written by none other than Douglas Adams. Yes, that Douglas Adams. Yeah, and I will tell you what's interesting is as we're recording this, it is the weekend after the presidential inauguration, and we normally stay away from politics on this uh, podcast. But however, there is in the first episode of this serial. I don't know about you, but there were a few moments that reminded me of Bain or Trump, right? right. <laughs> Just a little bit, and we'll talk about that, I guess, when we get a little closer. Yeah, you know, are, you, are you saying the captain in this story is a little bit like Donald Trump? A new golden age of prosperity for all. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. And uh, we should also point out that, uh, for those who don't know, Peter Capaldi, the 12th Doctor, showed up at the Women's March yesterday in Britain. So cheers to Peter Capaldi for uh, supporting the ladies out there. Yes, and I just uh, shared um, the actress who plays Supergirl, Melissa. M- Benoist, yeah, yeah. Yeah, had, I think, one of the rudest yet yeah. funniest signs ever. Well, I think sometimes, you, and especially in this case, you need to be rude to get people's attention. Yes, but um, I, I, I saw I that. I find it rude at all. But I, I thought it was hilarious. Um, yes, it was just so. Um, you you will find it if you uh, look for it, and uh, uh, yes. if you're offended by the p word, you probably didn't vote for Mr. Trump, mm-hmm. uh, President Trump. But uh, she did the great use of the p word. That was just wonderful. I just was like, this is – if I didn't love her already, I love her even more. See, I didn't even know there was a P word, but that's me. Uh, okay. All right. So moving on. Uh, we have um, – we're going to get back to Doctor Who now. So yes. we uh, – so um, yeah, this is uh, – this was written by Douglas Adams, The Pirate Planet, and uh, directed by Pennant Roberts. And it's the second serial in season 16 back in 1978. And I'm really looking forward to getting your thoughts on this, Jesse, because, uh, you know, obviously this is a, a Douglas Adams story. Um, it's kind of like before he became the Douglas Adams we all know and love. Um, so I'm kind of curious your thoughts on this because this is definitely a more offbeat episode or offbeat story. And, uh, I'm kind of curious what you think about it. So I was going to bring that up, and I'm glad you did. This is a Douglas Adams written episode before he was Douglas Adams. Pretty Uh, much. Yeah. um, This year I was doing some research, and he is – 
Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy came out about this time. Um, yeah, for, first it came out as a radio program yeah. on in the BBC radio, but uh, then it was adapted into a novel, and yeah. uh, and that's obviously what launched him into a more right. um, famous stratosphere. Yeah. Um, I liked it, but I didn't love it. Okay, fair and, enough. And, and I went in knowing that it was Douglas Adams – wanting to love the episode kind of like when you hear neil gaiman is writing a doctor who episode you know my expectations were sky high and i was hoping just See, that's for... a, that's always a mistake i think you yes. should always keep your expectations tempered right but it's hard to do that um so uh but i think it might be uh, i don't know and that's why i'm really looking forward to talking to you about this because it's hard for me to put my finger on exactly why I didn't love it. And okay, so, so maybe, yeah, so maybe we'll, maybe we'll figure this out together as we discuss. Thank you. I, you know, the night is dark and full of terror, so I'm glad you're here to help me. <laughs> okay. Uh-oh, is the red is the red woman around? You know? <laughs> Hopefully yeah. she's not pregnant with some shadow. Exactly, creature. yes. Yeah. Little Game of Thrones reference there for you. All right, so uh, all right, let's get into the discussion a little bit. So uh, the first topic I have is the second segment, uh, the Fourth Doctor and the Key to Time. So here uh, we have uh, Tom Baker's Doctor, the Fourth Doctor, and um, they're off. He and Romana are off in search of the second segment of the Key to Time. And that takes us to uh, what the doctor refers to as a, the, a rather boring planet of Calufrax. And so this is where we kind of pick up. Um, the, the, the doctor is, um, I guess, well, I, I want to say Romana really first. She, uh, she has a – she's actually flipping through the TARDIS manual. The very little seen TARDIS manual. Yes, that's Charlie. Everyone, continue. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Jesse's son's dog has decided. Yeah. Apparently, he wants to chime in on the. Podcast. Yes, he does. He wants, like, hey, I like Doctor Who, Dad. So, um, yes, I, I love Romana watching the reading the um, huge manual. You know, it's on this looks this massive stand i mean it truly looks like one of the ceremonial uh <laughs> ceremonial bibles that are at this huge catholic church right it, it is there and um their chemistry charles is definitely a highlight of the episode i i love how after only you know one section of episodes this is their fifth episode together they're funny together there there is a good banter back and, fa back and forth he he likes her and but he loves picking at her and she likes him and she likes picking and and i, I so i may have jumped ahead on your agenda a little but, bit a little okay bit. But, <laughs> but to be fair you didn't share the agenda with me no no so, no, no. You're, yeah you're, right. you're absolutely yeah, right yeah expect... so it so this beginning though is just wonderful and what a nice way once again because of the timey wimey way we're watching Doctor Who you can't help but think of River Song saying the reason it makes that sound is you're doing the parking break because Romana is telling him oh th these two components you have to use when you're driving and he goes bah! <laughs> only yeah. amateurs use those well, things he, then he rips a page right out of the TARDIS yeah. manual <laughs> yeah but uh, uh but yeah and if you notice Romana pilots the TARDIS and it still has that same breaking sound so yeah. i think river just made that whole thing up i i totally do i think she's just harassing him and yeah. and 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 she knew a way to turn off the sound or something but i think she was yeah. just picking at him yeah. um it is but but, but obviously yeah. romana does a pretty good job at landing yes. the doctor at first because he doesn't they don't arrive exactly where he thinks they should arrive right uh so he's a little you know dismissive of her Thinks that oh, well, she obviously piloted the, the TARDIS wrong. 
Yeah. Uh, but as it turns out, no, no, she didn't. Yeah, I also kind of like this was, um, you know, K9 is starting to grow on me a little. Um, and I like that. How can you not like K9? I know. Everybody loves K9. I know. I have a, I have a dark soul. Um, the, Special you know. Special place in hell. That's yeah, what I'm saying. The, in, the implication is this is only a day or two after um, the previous episode, right? So he's polishing the key to time and he's talking to K9 about it. They have a lot of banter back and forth about it's a piece of cake and, you know, he's like, that piece of cake, what does, you know, a slice of confection have to do with this, you know, key of time? And It's a, it's a nice little gag. Yeah. It is. It was a really good gag. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, and, yeah, I'm glad you brought up the fact that uh, the Doctor and Romana have kind of settled into their relationship, their new companionship. Yes. And uh, it's obviously, like, I think I, we talked about this when we were discussing the ribose operation, is that, I think I mentioned that, uh, you know, that that kind of prickliness fades, you know, and, and they and they kind of settle into a much like Romana isn't so snotty. I mean, she can kind of be like kind of needle the doctor and kind of one up him. But but she's not a jerk about it. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think, um, you know, they're jumping ahead. There's a little wonderful point where she talks about my assistant and then, right. you know, he comes almost immediately, oh, I see you've met my assistant. Yeah. So, awesome. Yeah. And uh, we get to see a lot, of, once again, of the doctor's moral outrage. Yes. Which uh, we always seem to f enjoy. Uh, when he takes on the captain who uh, does some rather not, not so nice things of, oh, I don't know, like – Taking uh, his planet Xanax and surrounding other planets and then consuming them into the, where they're little tiny um, condensed spheres and uh, just completely sucking them dry of every available resource. Yeah. And the doctor, as you might admit, or you, as you might guess, has a bit of a problem with that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it, it is um – I like – the more I watch Tom Baker, the more um, I, I like his doctor, and that certainly isn't shocking. You know, he's – for many, he is the doctor, and and I, I love his um, – you know, it goes back to that famous phrase that often in error, never in doubt – um, you know, he has – like I, I specifically mentioned the point in a couple episodes where he's trying to pick the lock, you know, right. and the sonic screwdriver doesn't work. And then he takes the bobby pin, and that doesn't look like it works. And then the door opens, and he's – just takes credit for it, you know. And, and yeah. I, my note actually was sonic screwdriver didn't open the door, hairpin didn't work, or did it? You're right. Yeah. Maybe it's just a delayed reaction. Absolutely, could be. Yeah, but uh, but yeah, there's a lot of great moments. <clears throat> Douglas Adams really gives Tom Baker a lot to play with in this story. Uh, a lot of great lines. Uh, Douglas Adams has this tendency to to come up with these like really intricate, babbly, um, techno babble um, lines. And Tom Baker has the ability to just rattle those off. So it's a, it, it actually worked – Tom Baker reciting Douglas Adams' lines works really well, I think. And uh, he's one of the few actors that could probably carry that off. And you know, just to give this complete nonsense um, a bit of authority, and it, I think that comes off. And there's a lot of scenes where we see like, like in that little um, – that kind of gravity lift – thing yeah. where where the doctor you know like he's kind of a know-it-all about that yeah like like roman is about to get on or whatever and he's like look here let me show you how it's done yeah and then he takes off on the gravity lift but then he's like whoa it's a yes. little too much <laughs> hurt for him and he can't handle it yeah in fact you know there is a twinkle in his eye and and a a kind of humor in his voice 
and it, it makes me go back to you know his cameo in the 50th anniversary special as the caretaker and you just the age and years fly away and it is the doctor right i mean it is that right. exact persona and it is that mannerism and that kind of air and it just you're going wow how how cool is that that you're able to be he's so comfortable in that role right well yeah, yeah because you know obviously by this point uh he's been at it for about four years i believe and uh so he's kind of uh in his groove this is this is tom baker as the fourth doctor in his prime yeah. Yeah, and you know he can give like for like just a little throwaway scene, like when Kanan runs out of power. Yeah. In episode in episode four, and he kind of whispers in close to Kanan, and you know like here's whatever Kanan's saying yeah. to him, just just as the last bit of power runs down. Yeah. And then he snaps up, and Romana asks him what. What it, you know, what K9 said, and he goes, Well, there's a power cable behind him. Yeah, you're thinking it's you know, going to be something it, it, really just, touching, yeah, and you know, like, you know, very, uh, oh, not he was reminding me that I could just plug him in next door, yeah, yeah, yeah so, that, so just, just something a little throwaway scene like that, but, but he just gives it such magic. Yes. And that's to Dom, Tom Baker's credit. Absolutely. The other thing I absolutely adore in these opening scenes is the running gag that I am so happy has become part of the mythos is that the TARDIS is a vintage machine, that mm -hmm. it is an outdated model. It and I just love like that Roma, Romana never studied it because right. it was so obsolete by the time she was yes. in the academy. Yeah, and and you know that has stuck to the modern era, and 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 I love that. I love the fact that you know, um, sexy or old girl, you right. know, has that idea, and and oh. the other great moment, absolutely great moment was. When he's kind of being all puffy and so the doctor, do you know how long I've been doing this? And she, 523 years. And he goes, uh, yes. <laughs> you know, just, a, just, just pops my, his. He goes, my, does it, time does fly, doesn't yes, it? Yes, yes, it was. Something to that effect. But, yeah, yeah, that was just wonderful. Yeah, and it's just, so, yeah, just, and it's that great chemistry. And uh, so – and we're kind of we're kind of into this already, so okay. let's let's kind of digress a little bit to um, the second topic, which, as you probably already guessed, uh, was on the companions. Yeah, uh, trying to come up with a clever title. All I could come up with was uh, the Companions Guide to the Galaxy. Ah, uh, nice. Little, I like that. To the Hitchhikers. Yeah. Uh, so this is Romana and K9. Yeah. And and so we t we kind of talked about Romana a little bit. Mm -hmm. Romana isn't isn't as central to this story. No. But she does get some things to do. Yeah. And um, I did want to talk about that. Uh, one of the one of the things that I thought was kind of interesting, um, where K9, K9 points out to the doctor that Romana is prettier than him. That is such a great – because the doctor is kind of – what? She yeah, is? Was, yeah, well, yes. Yeah, well, to set this up, this is a whole big sequence where the doctor's running around the, this courtyard on uh, on Xanax trying to get everybody's attention. Yes. And trying to get them to – he's trying to get some information about what's going on. Nobody is listening to him. Everybody is ignoring him. And then all of a sudden, here comes Romana, and there's this guy, and she just like starts chatting him up. And going, hey, you know, like I, I was trying to get some information here, mm -hmm. and he starts talking to her, and the doctor is just incredulous about this. Oh yeah. So, so he goes to K9 and like, you know, can't understand what's going on, and then K9 has to like lay it out for him, which is pretty funny. It's very funny, and um, I loved. Once again, the doctor is clueless about women. Yes, the the interaction with Romana, asking the questions. Getting the needed information, offering the candy to the guy, you know, and the, the doctor's jelly, like, jelly, jelly yeah, yeah. yeah, like what, 
what? Where did you get those? Same place you did, your pocket. Right. You know, it, it just is so... And it, and it seems like the fourth doctor has a never-ending supply of jelly babies. Yes, it does. Like, he, he can throw a bag away, and then here he is, like, maybe a couple episodes later, he's got another bag already. Yes. yes. There in his, is... Uh, in his yeah. pockets of holding. Yes, exactly. Um, it, that was really neat. And... Um, it was cool to see K-9 as a weapon a couple of times. Um, there is the scene coming up, uh, jumping ahead, yeah. when when uh, the doctor's me- mechanical r- robot dog fights the captain's mechanical robot parrot. Yes. <laughs> that, yeah, and, and, that, and that was great because K-9 actually got a bad guy of his own to yes. take out. Yeah, and he wins. He does because canine. So mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, he was good and good and, dog. Yeah, and, you know it goes back to uh, Mickey saying, "I don't want to just be the dog," but in this case, you really saw, um, you know, canine is a true companion, and and he's right. helping the doctor. So yeah, good stuff. Yep. Well, and uh, yeah, I totally agree and love that a bit. Uh, actually, I love that a lot. But uh, yeah, I thought that was great. The uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else with Romana and K9. I now want fan fiction of K9 meeting Crypto. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying somewhere out there, if you guys have it, send me the link because I think that would be awesome. <laughs> Well, as long as it's clean. Because oh yeah, I don't want. Yeah, I don't because want. Because some of that fan fiction could be just. Yes. No. 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 I don't do, like the, I, no. Yeah. I don't want slash fiction. Fiction. Just fan slash fiction. fiction. Yeah. Yes. We don't okay. Want that. Right. So yeah, we would have, we had to put that qualifier out. Good point, comes. Charles. Excellent point. No problem. Just trying to save you a little hassle. Down <laughs> Thank the you, sir. I appreciate it. Looking out for you. Um, so yeah, we had that. Um, okay. So let's talk about um, my third topic. Pirates of the Calufraxian. <laughs> Saw what you did there. Um, Thank you. So, yeah, let's talk about the captain and Mr. Fibuli and uh, the nurse who mm-hmm. turns out to be more than a nurse. Mm-hmm. So I did write on my first notes a golden – And the ads too if you want to throw yeah, them in. A new golden age of prosperity for all. Um, you know, I wrote chicken in every pot, a TV in every home. Um, it, it was – a little too close to home sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, well, yeah. I, you, keep in mind this is 1978. Yeah, I know. And uh, uh, here we here we are. Yeah. Almost 40 years later. Yes. And um, we have our circumstances today. And so my notes on chapter two, and I'm going to quote them. The captain is funny with his hyperbole. My horns of profit. Hyperbole. Yeah, hyperbole. Thank you. But I did in parentheses, is the captain being manipulated by someone? And I don't know why I picked that up, but I had just that slight feeling that maybe. um, I I think he – The big big man in charge is not the big man in charge, really. Um. I felt that the captain's costume was a little too much and too clunky. Uh, yeah, clunky. Um, well, let's keep in mind, 70s BBC. I understand. Um, but I thought he was interesting. I did like the interaction almost like Miss Tessmacher right. you know where he's always yelling at the guy see, and threatening see, big, to kill him big bombastic supervillains never go out of style right and he was uh, interactions so um, it, it just it was really nice it was a nice um, collection I, I like the villains in the piece uh, except for the clunky makeup and setting um, you know, so they but, were, but, but at least they were, they weren't forgettable. No, they weren't. They, and it was, it, it was, uh, I think the idea of this, uh, economic miracle and like, Hey, we know we're trying to keep everybody happy. So we're, yeah. we're going to keep like going around and consuming all these planets. We're not going to tell anybody what we're doing, but yeah. So they're going to all think I'm great. Yeah. 
And so I I liked um I liked the villains. I thought they were good villains. I thought it was an interesting um story. So um the the surprise at the end where the nurse was the famous the Queen's you know, yeah, yeah. Sanxia. Um I didn't it wasn't a you, big shock, but it wasn't like I went, oh, that's who she is. I just went, oh, that makes sense. So were you at all suspicious of the nurse or – because if because I was rewatching – as I rewatched this story, mm-hmm. um, the, I was making note that the nurse is in every scene. Yes. And she just – she's shown in the background watching. Yes. Like, like she doesn't – you know, she doesn't – she just kind of lets the the captain – go off and rant and blah, 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 and she's just kind of like watching to see what goes on. Yes, I agree. And then, you know, more and more, she, and then every so often, like when Mr. Fibberly leaves the room, then, and, they're, and the two are alone, then she speaks up. Yeah. And she's not really talking to the captain in a subservient tone. She's talking to him in a more authoritative tone. And the other thing when she says – um, killing more than one person a day is bad for your blood pressure, and um, the whole when Romana is there, and they're like, I think that's a very interesting story, don't you, Captain? You know, so yes, you got the feeling something was going on more than uh, they're trying to lead you to believe. Right, and I thought it was a very cool sci-fi idea to have, like, oh, we've got this old queen that everybody hated. She's still alive, but she's in this kind of time bubble. Yeah. And her mind is now in this other body. Yes. And just kind of like pretending to be a subservient nurse, but actually the one in charge. Yeah, I I, I, I agree with you. I like that. Yeah. Um, one of the things I liked, I want to talk to you about was um, there's this great cliffhanger at the end of episode three where the doctor – because it's a pirate story, he gets to walk the plank. And I wonder your thoughts on that. So I I love the fact that they embrace that cliche, right? Right, right. Well, and, you, get, you, got, you got a pirate story. You've got to have somebody walk yeah. the plank, right? And um, once it's again, um, how physical – how genius of the physical comedy of Tom Baker. Like he's like one foot and like, ah, and so, um, now now after watching part three, that cliffhanger where he does go off the, yeah. The, uh, were you wondering like, okay, how does he get out of this one? I was a little bit, I, you know, I had no doubt he would figure it out, but I was, you know, we had the flying cars, but you couldn't, couldn't, oh, so you thought he landed on one of the flying cars maybe or something. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. That's a good, that's a good theory. Yeah. That that was nice. But uh, obviously it turned out to be something different. Yes. And I thought playing playing around with holograms. Yes. And, uh, I love when the doctor talks to the doctor, you know, the hello doctor. Hello. Yes. Yes, That was, (laughs) yes, that was very genius. And I do like that. He goes, um, a plank. You can't be serious. Like, come on. There there are how many cliches. Um, I do want to, it, I did have another moment in episode three when um, they they make the statement they slammed him to the wall with good vibrations, right. and I was like, as a Beach Boy fan, I'm like, good, yep. good, I'm good, a, good vibrations. I'm a big nip, I'm a big nip, good vibrations. Vi- exactly. So I thought that was a funny line. Yeah, that would have been that would have been pretty funny if like yeah. somehow that would have started playing. At yes. that point. right. All right, so um, uh, so we let's see what else. Um, we got the Mentiads, who don't really end up doing much apart from just like okay, we discovered we're we're Mentiads. Yeah, I think that's where you kind um, of thought it was like, what's the point of the Mentiads? Yes, I I think that subplot, and like the young guy, like the. The family, and you know, he's you know the son. He has, has men- that mental. He becomes yeah. a, he becomes a mentiad. Yeah. And ends up getting recruited by them. 
I think it was just so to give the Mentiads some kind of mystery, sense I of think mystery, so. because you're like, hey, who are these weird guys in yeah. yellow robes? And they just kind of come out and like, OK, they're claiming our son. What's up with that? And the brother and the um, or the the other, you know, the I guess it's the sister. And then is that her boyfriend or I, I see I they were you got a little confused. Yeah, very yeah. forgettable side characters. And I think which is why the Rebus operation, the supporting cast were all very memorable and really enjoyable and good. This was you had pretty good villains right. and you had excellent Doctor and the Companions and the rest were, I think, fairly weak. Okay. Am I Fair being way. a little hard on them? No, or? I, no, I don't think you are at all. I think I could, I totally get that point of view. Okay. So, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's. It, I don't think it's as strong of an effort for Douglas Adams as a as City of Death was because mm-hmm. he completely rewrote that script. Yeah. Um, and. Uh, I think it's just yeah. I just think that yeah. This this was kind of like his first story. So. Sure, absolutely. And so you know, you just he's kind of finding himself a little bit. Yeah. And and with Douglas Adams, I mean, there's a he throws out a lot of science yes, more than you typically get in Doctor right. Who, especially in the 70s. Sure. I mean, he's he's throwing out concepts of black holes and holograms and stuff that yeah. really doesn't like settle into the sci-fi mainstream until like Star Trek The Next Generation or something. Yeah, because you've got these whole miniature, what's left of the planets all held in suspension and and talking about the whole gravitational balance of of the the systems and whatnot. So Mm. yeah, he's throwing out a little like a lot of uh, scientific concepts. Yeah. And uh, which is, which I think is great from if you're a science geek. Yes. And especially considering how early it is compared to stuff down the road. Mm-hmm. Yes. So I just I thought that was kind of cool. Okay, good. But all right. Um, anything else you want to talk about, like Mr. Fibuli or? You know, just I think they were they were well done, and and I like them all. Like I said, I I think now that we've talked about it, I believe. If you're going to overanalyze, which, hey, that's what we're here for, right? right? A, a great episode has – We specialize in overanalyzing. Yeah, a wonderful interaction, the Doctor and the Companions. And then on the other triangle point is a really strong villain. And then I think the third point is either a really good mystery or that there are characters you care about that – you know, you go, wow, I would have liked to have seen them again. And and this was pretty good villains. Excellent, excellent. I mean, it's it's almost like uh, Douglas Adams really spent most of the time almost overcompensating, really working on the Doctor and Romana's interactions. Well, I, I think he, that's the stuff he really enjoyed. Yeah, that? I think so too. And it, yeah, it does come off that way. Yeah, I totally yeah. agree. So, what did you think of the revelation that uh, the second segment of the key to time is actually the planet Calufrax? Yeah, um, I thought that was a, a really good um, MacGuffin they kind of, because they, 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 they kind of foreshadowed it, they, that really well. They, yeah, because like Romana has the. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, yeah, Romana has the the little detector. Yeah. And she's getting readings from everywhere. Right. And she can't figure out. The doctor seems like he kind of has suspicions. And and I love the fact that it it looks like they've lost the detector. Mm-hmm. And she's like, I thought you had it. And he's like, oh, yes, I do. I mean, that was just, <laughs> just a nice little talk about little moments of comedy and – you know, bits that the, you know, Tom Baker is doing as the fourth doctor. That was a really nice thing that just, it was like, oh, that's, that's funny. That was clever. Yeah. Yeah. And Douglas Adams is great at those little throwaway moments. Yes. And even made even better because you got someone like Tom Baker that Mm -hmm. can really, and Mary Tam, because Mary Tam, you got to give some credit there because she, she gives as good as she gets. Yeah. She's really nice. I, you know, there, 
And she has a more practical outfit this time. <laughs> Very practical outfit and looks really good. I she's she's wearing pants. So. Yes, she is. Yes, it was very smart. As opposed yeah. to a big flowy dress last yeah, time. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. She kind of picked, learned some things, I think. Right. All right. Um, and you know, couple, oh, at the very ahead. beginning of the episode, he's not wearing a scarf because he's inside. Right. Which I thought was kind of nice, you know, to see him. And then I will tell you, Charles. <laughs> Yeah. I'm I'm watching the doctor walk, and the scarf is dragging on the ground, and I keep thinking, man, isn't that going to get really dirty? <laughs> like, you know, he's going to step in the mud with it, and well, then I moved on. He doesn't have to clean it. So. Yeah, exactly. There you go. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you think of it like, okay, I'm going to walk back in the TARDIS, and then there's like all this mud tracked in. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so um, uh, anything else you want to talk about about this story? Um. Let me look at my notes. Uh, no, I mean, a lot of good quotes. Um, it is kind of a abrupt ending. Right. It's like, and... Um, well, you know, they, they blow up the bridge. Yes. And, and they get, you know, if you notice, the doctor kind of gets the mentiads to do it. Yes, He's he like, does. Like, so you got to blow that up. And we're, we kind of wait there forever for them to, right. like, mind, like, mentally or telekinetically push yes. that plunger down. Yeah. Even though somebody could have just gone up there and go, okay, the plunger's down. Yeah. Which I thought was kind of funny. And it's kind of funny that it's and such the doctor, a. It's responsibility. He keeps yeah. his hands clean. It's also such a outdated looking out of you know yeah. uh, you know plunger so that was it seems like uh yeah so it was good well maybe the doctor got it out of his tardis somewhere that was, yeah. he's had for a couple centuries or what absolutely have you. yes so yes uh, i did uh, like the comment there was uh not under my quotes but just the whole you know, someone living forever is a bad thing, you know, and like, well, you know, <laughs> that was kind of nice. The um, So uh, a couple of things I want to bring up before we get into best lines of the episode. OK. Um, in the story, the future story, t uh, 10th Doctor story, The Stolen Earth, they make a reference to a planet known as Calufrax Minor. Ah, OK. As one of the stolen planets that was used by, in Davros's reality bomb. Okay. So just a little nod there. So like when you watch the stolen Earth, okay. then uh, you're just like, hey, oh yeah, Calufrax Minor. That's like Calufrax in uh, the Pirate Planet. Okay. And um, there was also a bit where the Doctor's unconscious, and he's like being captured by the Captain, and he's like talking about it. he's mumbling like, no more Janus Thorns. Yes. And that, of course, is a reference to Leela, his previous companion, right? Who, who used these little things called Janus Thorns as a, like you know a little blowgun thing to kind of take out people because it's they were poisonous. Um, I did, as I was watching this DVD, I did Google that, and oh, you know yeah. to figure out what that was because I I figured it was some kind of reference to a previous thing. Yeah. yeah, so hopefully we'll uh, we'll get to some uh, Leela doc Fourth Doctor and Leela stories at some point. Absolutely, and uh, you'll get to appreciate that a little Absolutely. more. Absolutely. Okay, um, so let's move on to uh, our favorite lines of the episode. And Douglas Adams, there's got to be some favorite lines. There is. Um, so starting at the very beginning, I'm perfectly capable of admitting when I'm wrong. Yes, this time I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like that one. A lot. Yeah, good. Um, so I'm got uh, this exchange between the doctor and the captain, where a lot of the line, the really good bantery lines, where I thought. Yeah. Um, so the, the doctor's like, "What is it you're really up to, eh? What do you want? You don't want to take over the universe, do you? No, you wouldn't know what to do with it beyond shout at it." <laughs> That's a good line. Yeah. I also loved. Good looks are no substitute for a sound character. <laughs> was at the very first episode. I like that one, too. It was really very nice. nice. Very nice. And uh, so another exchange between the Doctor and the Captain, um, where the Captain's kind of showing off his operation to the yeah. Doctor. And the Doctor goes, it's the most brilliant piece of astro gravitational engineering I've ever seen. The concept is simply staggering. Pointless, but staggering. Yeah. The Captain replies, I'm gratified that you appreciate it. 
or more like, I'm gratified that you, are, you appreciate it. Yes. And uh, the doctor replies, appreciate it? Appreciate it? What, you commit mass destruction and murder on a scale that's almost inconceivable, and you ask me to appreciate it? Just because you happen to have had made a brilliant conceived toy out of the mummified remains of planets? Yeah, that was nice. Um, and then, and, and I love that moral outrage. I love oh, I love the moral I, I Yes, absolutely. Um, another nice moment was um, – which again, which you love Ramona and Ramona and the Doctor. This um, that was good, quite ingenious. It's brilliant. It's fantastic. <laughs> Once yep. again, the Doctor is not afraid of patting himself on the back. And you know, hey, he's kind of like uh, setting the tone for the Ninth Doctor down the road. Yes, absolutely. Because that's the Ninth Doctor's favorite catchphrase. Yes, so. it is. Absolutely. So if, you, so if you're kind of a Ninth Doctor geek, go back and watch this and get a little, get a little Ninth Doctor out of the Fourth Doctor. Absolutely. Yeah. Any others and, for you, Charles? Uh, yeah. One, yeah. One more exchange between the Captain and the Doctor. As you can tell, I really like. Yeah. Those. Um, real quick one though. Uh, this one, uh, the Captain says, "So, Doctor, you have survived." The doctor replies, yes, I'm afraid I seem unable to break the habit. <laughs> that is awesome. I love that. That which is, is great. Which is a per, which is a, a quintessential Douglas Adams type line. Yes, and it goes back to uh, what's the first thing the doctor does when Missy and Claire are talking. He decides he's going to win. He decides he's going to escape, right? Right. So absolutely. Um any others? Uh, nope, I'm good. How about okay. ratings? Ratings. Why don't you go first? Okay. Um, like I said, this was not my favorite. And once again, it's – the Ribosaw operation was really strong. But I right. would give this 8 out of 10 Beards of the Sky Demon. Oh, nice. <laughs> yes. <laughs> One of those little exclamations. Yes, absolutely. From, from the captain. Yeah. Yes, I did love all of those. Yeah, there are, are some great ones. Um, I'm a sucker for a God, Douglas Adams, as I've mentioned many, many times before. So yes. I'm a little more generous with this one, um, as you might imagine. So I give it 9 out of 10 crushed planets in a t- trophy room. Ooh, good. Very nice. Very so, nice. Yeah, to kind of work in our, uh, our key to time segment a little bit there. Yeah, very good. But, so, uh, Mr. Charles... Yes, if Mr. we're going to go back in the TARDIS slash Wayback Machine and reverse the polarity, reverse the polarity, what yep. is our modern era episode you think would be a good companion to this? So that would mean we go ahead in the TARDIS. I guess we would. Because, because we're going from 1978. Yes. We're going to go all the way to 2011, as you might guess. Uh, the third episode of Series 6, uh, The Curse of the Black Spot. Yes, yes. So uh, you probably guessed that's one. I actually did think about that, yeah. Um, it's a pirate story, so yes, it seems it like is. an obvious connection. So uh, it's written by Steve Thompson, and uh, we have the 11th Doctor, Amy and Rory, arriving on a 17th century pirate ship called the Fancy. And the trio ends up getting brought to Captain Avery's cabin, and Captain Avery is an actual real-life person. Mm-hmm. That they incorporated into uh, a Doctor Who story, um, where the Doctor reveals that they picked up the ship's distress calls. The crew, however, insists that they made no such calls. Right. Ooh, mystery. Ooh. So, so when the Doctor compares the time travelers to sailors, in air quotes, sailors. Yes. Uh, they are held at gunpoint by Avery and accused of being stowaways. The captain, knowing there is too little water to sustain all of them until the wind picks up, orders the Doctor and Rory to walk the plank because yes. you can't have a pirate story without walking the planks. So Absolutely. There's our main connection. Uh, while commanding Amy to the scullery. So as the Doctor is prepared to jump in the water, Amy reappears, brandishing a sword, frightening the crew who do not wish to be injured in yes. any way. So the crew is uh, attacked by a mysterious and beautiful sea creature known as the Siren, as it turns out. But uh, guess what? She's not actually a demon, but a virtual doctor on an alien spaceship who has been caring for the injured crew. 
Right. And so um, there's a whole sequence of events, and then uh, Avery ends up – it's brought up that the uh, alien spaceship needs a captain, and um, – Avery's son apparently has typhoid fever and needs to remain on the ship, so he ends up volunteering for the position so he can continue looking after his son, of course. And uh, so they end off like soaring off into space, and the and uh, Avery's in the captain's seat with his son Toby and his crew by his side. That's kind of the story. Yeah, you know, I always liked that story and I'm glad you picked it. I know some people thought it was a weak story, but I thought it was I thought it was a nice twist and I thought a, a good ending and I would love to see the pirates make you know they make an appearance later in that right. um series. I would have loved to see them again sometime because I thought that was fun. Yeah, maybe catch up, see what yes. they're doing. Absolutely. And if, and if uh for those who don't know, that's Hugh Bonneville as Captain Avery. Who, of course, plays Lord Grantham on Downton Abbey. Ah, oh, very nice. So if you're a Downton Abbey fan. There you go. Um, yep. So, um, yeah, I just – I think that one's an okay story. It's mm-hmm. not my favorite, but uh, – right. But I think it's decent enough. Absolutely. And, you know, it's pirates. There you go. It's pirates. So, yeah, if you're in a pirate mood, yeah. Yeah. Doctor Who and pirates, always fun. Always and fun. Nothing, if nothing else, it's kind of great to see um, Karen Gillan decked out in pirate garb. Yes. And Rory recognizing that it's a nurse. Um, yeah. I always like when Rory has a little something to I go. totally agree. Yeah. yeah. He, he obviously never got as much to do as right. Amy did because he wasn't the main companion. Right. But, Absolutely. Yeah. He was the companion's companion. Absolutely. Um, so uh, this was fun overall. Yeah. Now uh, we're continuing – our search for the key of time in our next episode, correct? Yes. So, uh, so for episode seventy-four, uh, we're going to discuss the stones of blood. Ooh. Ooh. And uh, that's actually the one hundredth story of Doctor Who. Oh, nice. So a uh, little, little bit of an anniversary there. Okay. But, um, but yeah, this is uh, the third segment in the key to time. So this will take us to the halfway point. And uh, our little mystery. And I think it's a it's I think you enjoy this one a little better. OK, good. Well, I certainly want to make sure no one thinks I mean, I gave it an eight out of ten. So, no, that's yeah, perfect. yeah, it's yeah. It's just yeah, um, just a thing. Um, but I think but I think you'll enjoy. It. I'll be surprised if you don't. Thanks. So, Charles, if Jesse, we have expressed our opinions, but right. we want to hear what our listeners say and think right. about the episodes and our little babbling on about Doctor Who, if they want to give us feedback on the show, how can they? Well, did we get some feedback from Fred We did, Feinstein? and I was going to bring that up after well, you, you say it. Oh, okay. well, why don't you go ahead and do it first, okay. and then I'll give the address Okay, out. good. Yeah, so Fred uh, reached out to us, and it was actually um, back in December, and um, Fred is – a wonderful often gives us feedback via Twitter and other things. And he sent us an email that says at the office a couple of months ago, I left my doctor who mug in the coffee room as I often do making a side trip to the men's room. When I returned, the new cleaning guy in our building was making his rounds in the coffee room and complimented me on the mug. He said he is a Doctor Who fan and attended this year's New York Comic Con. This was a very nice surprise, considering there are very few people in our office, and most are not sci-fi fans. Since then, he stops by my desk to chat or show me pictures of his collectibles, stuff like that. A couple of days ago, he gave me a fourth Doctor Funko keychain because he had two of them. I'm not even sure I told him that Tom Baker was my doctor, but that was so nice. On the subject of Doctor Who merchandise, Costco in my area at least is selling a Doctor Who book called The Complete Visual Collection, published by DK Books. I just happened to be browsing the coffee table books Costco puts out every year for the holidays, and there it was for less than $20. 
And um, he says, thanks as always for talking Doctor Who. You got to figure Fred's loving that we are doing a whole series of Baker episodes. I would think so. And and hopefully, Fred, I hope uh, you kind of uh, pimped us out to your friend and said, hey, I know about this great Doctor Who podcast called Next Stop Everywhere. Absolutely. So, yeah, throw us a little love there. Uh, help, uh, help, uh, help us help you. Absolutely. Fred. All right. So th- thanks. I'm not sure exactly if that was really feedback, but uh, thanks for, for sharing a, an anecdote. Absolutely. Yes. Exactly. So thanks, Fred. Um, so if you like Fred and you want to give us some feedback or anecdotes, um, you can reach us at uh, Next Stop Every- Next Stop Everywhere SMG at gmail.com or the easier way to do it is uh, Next Stop Everywhere, the Doctor Who podcast on Facebook. You can find us there. We will gladly respond to you. And uh, you can also reach us at Next Stop SMG on the Twitter machine where we're all over Twitter and we'll get back to you there. You can send us a direct message if that's easier or just you know respond to us in a tweet or what have you. And, and uh, we'll be glad to say hi. Absolutely. And uh, thanks for supporting us there, too. So yeah. That would be great. Um, so, yeah, if you give us uh, – yeah, if you could follow us or like us as needed on, on Facebook and Twitter, that would be great. Uh, we'd really appreciate it. We've gotten – I think we're up 156, 158 likes on Facebook. We're up there. So Yeah, uh, we are. Thanks to everybody. Thanks to everybody who's been uh, liking us on Facebook. We'd obviously love more. So we're on the road to 200, the mighty 200, because it's Doctor Who. you got to have the mighty 200. Yes. And like that little nod to Planet of the Dead there. I did. I like that a lot. All right. So uh, so get us to the mighty 200. And, um, and Jesse, where can they reach you? Well, I can be reached at Jesse Jackson DFW um, on the Twitter machine. I am also have a Facebook page, uh, Jesse Jackson. You can do a search, Louisville, uh, Texas. Um, we, uh, you can hear me talk about Bruce Springsteen on Set Lusting Bruce, and uh, that's been a lot of fun. So um, we, um, and Charles, how about you? Uh, I am, of course, at Charles Skaggs on the Twitter machine. At Charles Skaggs on the Instagram. Google Plus for all you crazy kids on the Google Plus. Shout out to Karen. And uh, Facebook, of course, Charles Skaggs. Or my blog of geeky things, Damn Good Coffee and Hot, where I talk about Doctor Who, Next Stop Everywhere, and class, and what have you. Maybe some Torchwood, maybe some Sarah Jane Adventures, or all kinds of comics and sci-fi goodness out there as well. Um, and I also talk about um, my other podcasts, uh, the Phantom Zone podcast, which I do with a friend of the show, Karen Lindsay. And uh, we need to have Karen back. It's been yes, a while. We do. So, yes. so we need to talk some. Maybe we should be doing some with this because she loves Tom Baker so much. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, but, uh, so we've got that. Um, and then uh, my other podcast, which is just recently started, uh, Ghostwood, the Twin Peaks podcast, which I do with Zan Sprouse, uh, wife of comic book artist Chris Sprouse. Nice. And uh, we're actually kind of longtime fan or friends a little bit. Uh, we known each other since conventions way back in the day, and uh, we we're been kind of we throw back lines back and forth on Facebook, and I know I knew that. Uh, Zan was a huge Twin Peaks geek as I am, and I was looking for someone enthusiastic, a fan from back in the day like myself. So I think Zan's the perfect choice uh, for this. Um, but uh, we just uh, – we have our first episode up on iTunes or Libsyn, which where we discuss uh, the latest novel to come out from Mark Frost, uh, The Secret uh, History of Twin Peaks. Ooh, Nice. Which is great, uh, a fantastic book. Um, but uh, and you can get that at your local Barnes and Noble at the moment, okay, or or Amazon, uh, or you know iBooks or what have you. 
uh, this that we just uh, a couple of days ago we recorded our second episode, which is not available yet, but hopefully will be up soon, uh, based on the Secret Diary of Laura Palmer, which was a fictional diary novel. It's a tie-in to the first season of the television show Twin Peaks, and it was written by Jennifer Lynch, uh, daughter of Twin Peaks co-creator David Lynch. So uh, if you're a Twin Peaks fan or a fan of David Lynch, uh, please come check us out. Very nice. Very good. Um, so I, I think that's it, right? Uh, we're, gonna, we're talking about what we're going to do next episode. Yep. Next next time, The Stones of Blood. The Stones is a great of great Blood. Great. That is a great title. It's a great title. So. Yeah. So thank you, Charles. Um, I also want to say um, I appreciate the kindness you um, shared because you were – Torn between family and podcast loyalty during the football season, and you um, very very touchy subject. I didn't want to offend anybody. Yes, you did, and you but you were very um, supportive of me during my depression of the Cowboys doing their annual break my heart sex sex uh, session. Uh, so well, yeah, well as a Cle- as a Cleveland Browns fan, I know all about having your heart broken. Yes, by your foot by your football team. Right. Far too well. I bet you do. Yes. Yeah. So, um, so I wanted to end with um, thanking Charles. Thank you, listeners. You're uh, very well, Jesse. Uh, keep hope alive and remember. Tell me, canine, how is it that you always look on the black side of things? Here I am trying a little lateral thinking, and what do you do? You trample all over it with logic. So. Great quote. Great yes. quote. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye, everyone.